if I could have your uh, attention again, we'll go ahead and reconvene. And um, I know I've kept you waiting, so again, I apologize for that a little bit. Um, I will go ahead and, without further ado, ask that, um, let's see, let's, Gary, you still remember the words of pledge, right? You can lead us in pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome you all to our meeting, and um, we had closed session, we're now in the uh, public session portion, so we'll go right away to um, our public hearing, 5.1 public hearing regarding Proposition 30 Educational Protection Account, EPA, and the 2015-16 school year spending plan. So, do we have anybody who wants to speak on that? Gary, any comments? No. Any board members have any comments on it? Okay, move on. Item six, adoption approval of the agenda. 6.1, approval of agenda for the meeting of uh, 426-16 tonight. So moved. Yes, second. second. Any changes, corrections? Everybody good, okay. So approve, or I should call a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approval of the minutes, 7.1, approval of the minutes of 412-16. Everybody had a chance to look at it? Any corrections, changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And we'll move right into special recognition reports and presentations. Presentation is Students of the Month for April 2016. You know what, Phoebe? I'm going to let you do it. We're going to share. I mean, you know, past administrations just did it themselves, but we're sharing with them. So, don't forget to thank your families, Phoebs. Yeah. Just in case you wonder about her qualifications, Phoebe's the only one of us that has her name on the junior high flag and the senior high flag. So, somewhat of an expert. And she's never done it before, so bear with me. We are going to start with Kenilworth Junior High School. Um, so, is the representative here? And we just ask you to state your name and go ahead and introduce your student. Hi, I'm Holly Van Rexler, eighth grade representative from Kenilworth Junior. I am pleased to announce our first student of the month for April 2016, Zena Zoo. Go ahead and orient them oh, to the camera. Yes. <laughs> to the camera. <laughs> Zenas has been selected by his team of teachers for student of the month because he is an excellent student. All teachers agree he is intelligent beyond his years, but he also knows how to have fun learning and participating. Mr. Schmidt states, Zenas enjoys the hands-on activities and intricate challenges in science. He is always ready to respond to questions and enjoys sharing his intellectual thoughts with the other students during class discussions and group work. Ms. Martin adds, Zenas is friendly, kind, and hardworking. He always has a positive and fun attitude in PE. And finally, Ms. Nemias says, Zenas is a great student with an easygoing personality. He is very humorous and social at times, but is always ready to apply himself and focus on schoolwork. Zenas is a very good student and is clearly extremely intelligent. Some of Zenas's more noteworthy accomplishments include winning first place in the AMC or American Math competition in November. He is also so advanced in math that he placed into honors algebra and attends class at Casa Grande during this eighth grade year. He plans on taking pre-calculus and trigonometry at the JC this summer. He also took computer programming at the SRJC last summer. He enjoys teaching himself math through textbooks in the Khan Academy. At Penelope, Mr. Eklund is his favorite teacher because he makes learning history fun and he assigns interesting projects. And looking toward the future, Zenas would like to attend a prestigious college such as MIT where he hopes to further his education in computer programming. Zenas' parents are very proud of him and all his accomplishments. They appreciate his amiable personality and sweet disposition. They feel fortunate to have him as a son. Congratulations, Zenas!
family here tonight. We'd like to give them a round of applause as well. I am pleased to introduce our second student of the month for April 2016, Salma Torres Lopez. because she is an excellent student who adds so much to the class by her presence. Ms. Monero states, Salma is an excellent math student. She puts her best effort into each and every problem and is willing to keep working at a problem until she truly understands. Salma is very kind with her classmates and is always willing to help them when needed. Ms. Farrell adds, Salma is an incredible student and extremely respectful. She is always smiling and friendly. She is a natural leader with tremendous creativity. Additionally, she is always encouraging her classmates. Finally, Mr. Schmidt says, Salma is a team player, personal and considerate. She is bright and confident in her abilities to accomplish required tasks in science. Salma is very active. She loves to play soccer and basketball. Outside school, she attends classes to prepare for her confirmation in May. She enjoys hanging out with friends and her family. They go to the park or beach and play soccer together. In looking towards the future, Salma isn't sure what she wants to be, but she's sure she wants to go to college to study something in the medical field. Salma's parents are very proud of her. They have this to add. Salma is a responsible and mature girl. She knows what she wants and has a lot of maturity. She is an excellent daughter and is the oldest sister. She is a great example. She likes to study and we can tell she wants to be someone in life. Congratulations, Salma. Thank you. 
representative of leadership. It is an honor and pleasure to announce Jake Simon as our male student of the month for April 2016. April 23, 2002. He's an excellent stu student, earning a 3.61 overall average and a 4.0 from last semester on his PGHS transcript. Not surprisingly, he earned academic achievement awards each semester and impresses his teachers with his motivation, dedication, and strong enthusiasm for learning. His history teacher says, Jake is such a pleasure to have in class. He is kind to others, he participates, and is always prepared. He is not afraid to make mistakes makes great eye contact, and is very personable. Jake plans on continuing his efforts in school so he can fulfill his aim to pursue a career in space science or engineering. Beyond his academics, Jake is very involved in, in many social and physical activities. He loves to play the piano. He participates in several outdoor activities, including soccer, tennis, swimming, camping, and fishing, but his passion is scuba diving. His natural inclination to observe worlds beyond ours is what led him to the underwater world and beckons him to outer space. Social justice is also important to Jake. While attending Grant Elementary, Jake and his aunt, who is a member of the Peace Corps, organize a pen pal system between his class and students in Amsterdam. Jake prefers to develop a connection with students from a different culture than spend time on local social media. He feels that much of the time spent online by his peers is wasted energy that could be better spent extending friendship and compassion to those who most need it. Jake's parents are Jake's parents are naturally very proud of him. They see him as a sensitive and deeply caring young man who is concerned about the world around him. They say, Jake takes his academics very seriously and is passionate about his current interests and hobbies. We agree. We are truly pleased to have Jake Simons represent Petaluma Junior High School in the April 2016 Student of the Month presentation to the board. some extracurricular achievement that has been going on at Costa Grande High School. Um, so starting with our band and our choir, uh, at the annual World Stride Heritage Festival in Anaheim, uh, choir and band performed extraordinarily well, garnering, garnering uh, several awards and medals for the performances at the Bulletin College. The varsity, jam, the varsity Jazz Band placed first, <coughs> Symphonic Band placed first, and JV Jazz Band placed third. Uh, culinary Club dominated the Chefs of Tomorrow competition held at the Hyatt Vineyard Creek Hotel in Santa Rosa. They won People's Choice and First Place, um, and a first for the Catering Club. Uh, the journalism program has also been thriving. Um, Casa Grande journalism students attended the 2016 GEA NSPA Journalism Convention in LA, and seven students won awards for their writing or their cartooning, um, so they did a particularly Good job there. And yesterday at the PDA, uh, the Press, Press Democrat Awards, journalism dominated um, there as well. We won eight out of ten. We, were, we got first place um, in eight out of ten categories, and we placed in all of them. In news and in feature writing, we placed first, second, and third. Mm -hmm. um, so our journalism program has been thriving. Um, a Costa Grande student, Kate Hoover, who's our editor in chief, has also been named as the journalist of the year. So now I'd like to move on to academic achievements. Our first student of the month is Tony Lin. Tony is very involved in academics, athletics, and other clubs at Casa Grande High School. Tony has taken at least seven classes each semester throughout his high school uh, career with some coming from the SRJC. He has taken 12 college and AP courses and three honors courses. For the past two years, he has also been part of the Casa Grande ACTEC, or Academic Decathlon team. As a senior, Tony became an assistant coach for the vars varsity girls basketball team and has coached a couple of J JV games as well. 
is now in his fourth year as a varsity Batman team with two first team all the honors in the first two previous seasons. Tommy was also extremely involved in the community with over, with over 1,500 community service hours. In the future, Tommy will likely attend college at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and major in electrical engineering. Congratulations, Tommy. Cosgrove High School this year. She has proved herself to be a hardworking student, which can be seen through her 4.3 academic GPA. She has taken many typical courses over the last four years, including a class at the Santa Rosa Junior College while attending Cosgrove. Alongside her schoolwork, Monique has accumulated over 380 hours of community service, proving herself to be an integral part of the community. She has also volunteered among the elderly of the community at PEP Housing, with the community's youth at summer camp, and with the beloved pets at Westside Animal Hospital. Her senior project consists of volunteering in a second grade classroom, teaching students algebra, science, vocabulary, and life skills that they will use for the rest of their life, lives. Monique has shown perseverance, determination, and leadership through her participation on Casa Grande's track and field team, running hurdles for the last three years and making the varsity team her junior and senior seasons. In the fall of 2016, Monique is attending uh, the University of California, Davis to study psychology. This will pave her way to her ultimate career goal of becoming a forensic psychologist in the FBI. Congratulations. Ooh. ranking him fifth in the senior class with a GPA of 
He is a dedicated member of nearly every music ensemble at Petaluma High School, including the marching band, concert band, varsity jazz band, and extracurricular ensembles like the jazz combo and drumline. He is the percussion he is the percussion section leader for those ensembles and the drumline captain and has served as a cabinet member for the Tri-M Honors Music Society. Outside of school, Eden also volunteers as a musical accompanist at Cinnabar Theater, where he is currently preparing for the spring production of Godspell. Additionally, Eden is a four-year member of both the Petaluma track and cross-country teams. He has been team captain of both teams for the past two years and has received recognitions such as a 4.0 Scholar Athlete and SCL All League, and has received team awards such as MVP and Most Inspirational. His dedication and leadership to the track program showed through, through last summer as he organized and directed the Trojan Track and Field Summer Camp, a student athlete run camp that introduces the sport of track and field to young runners. The camp also raised over $1,000 for the PHS track and field program. Recently, Eden has received multiple awards and recognitions. In February, he was crowned Petaluma High's Mr. GQ. <laughs> this, month, <laughs> this month, Eden was nominated as the Press Democrat Redwood Empire Scholar Athlete of the Year, received the Harold Mahoney Community Achievement Award, and received the Press Democrat Community Youth Service Award for Athletics. Next fall, Eden will be attending UCLA where he plans to study mass communications and media with a minor in entrepreneurship. While there, he hopes to take advantage of his surroundings by pursuing an internship, internship in the entertainment in industry and learning how to serve. Congratulations, Eden. Students 
students out there, you know, congratulations. We really, you know, like to hear about these accomplishments because that's why we're here. That's why your teachers are here. That's why the school staff's there. And ultimately, your parents, all of us are your fans and your champions, and we look forward to your continued success. And um, I wasn't kidding about the plaques. The junior high school students and high school students will each have a plaque up here. And for you junior high school students, we don't have very many repeat performers, so something to aspire to. Um, I'll have the parents and students, we have a couple more items, and then I'll um, let you go after um, we get past item 8.3, because I know there's homework and other pressing concerns, and the students' time, especially this time of year, is pretty valuable. So I'm going to go ahead and call um, the next item on the agenda is 8.2. We're going to have recognition of the Science Olympiad winners, and that's going to be presented by Principal Matthew Harris, Mr. DeLucia Seltzer, and team members and students from McKinley School. Um, I'm here to represent the McKinley Science Olympiad team, and in just a minute I'm going to invite the, this incredible, incredibly talented group of scientists up to meet you guys, um, as well as their, their fantastic, fantastic coach, um, Coach DZ. Um, but I just want to give you a quick little background. So a few years ago when I, um, when I was just a beginning principal up here in Petaluma, um, I was talking to some of my colleagues and they, they brought up um, hey, we're going to the Science Olympiad. And I said, oh, Science Olympiad, County Science Olympiad, sounds great. And I reached out, I said, how do I get, how do I get information? Oh, you didn't get the email. I said, no, no. So I reached out and they said, um, oh yeah, we didn't send it out to McKinley. We just, McKinley has participated for a few years, and for several years, and so we just thought you weren't interested. So that was the gauntlet was laid down for us. <laughs> and this is our, our second year now with the Science Olympiad. Um, Ms., Mr. Deasy, Coach Deasy has been, has brought these guys for the, the, their second year. Uh, this year, there were 24 teams all around the county participating in the Science Olympiad and sitting in the bleachers watching the naked egg drop, the very last event, and then them announcing the winner. And when, they, when, when she came up and said, we tallied all the results and the overall first place prize goes to McKinley Elementary School, Pebble City Schools. I told the students on uh, last Friday at the assembly, my heart was just bursting with pride for all the work that they, that they, that they did. Um, it's not about being first, placing first, but it definitely felt good to bring, bring that back to Pebble City Schools where it belongs. Um, but I was just blown away by the event in general and how it got students just, they were this love of learning. And I know that we go to different sports events and it was just fantastic to go to an event where it's all about um, academics and learning. So um, at the assembly last Friday, Coach DZ and I passed out a bunch of awards for our students. And so I have an award for Mr. DZ, so I want to just invite him, him to come up here. <laughs> so, Petaluma City Schools has some of the finest educators in the in the state, in the country, in the world, and. I have never worked with an educator so talented and so dedicated and passionate as Mr. Deasy. He's, he's the Pelham City Schools Teacher of the Year this year. And Coach Deasy, um, you gave a bunch of awards to the students, so this is just a small token here. But um, I have a certificate here. Congratulations, congratulations Coach Deasy, Science Olympiad Coach of the Year 2016. <laughs> we are deeply grateful for all that you do for our students. And I even got you a first prize, first prize ribbon. <laughs> So I want to, um, Matthew said a lot of, good evening everybody, uh, 24 teams, 16 schools, 330 students at the Sonoma County Science Olympiad, 14 events from catapult construction, you know, uh, to uh, the most buoyant barge, where they can hold the most pennies before sinking, to the most aerodynamic paper airplanes for accuracy and, um, and distance. Um, up and down, uh, 14 different events. Um, after being introduced to each event, the kids chose an event to specialize in, and uh, they persevered every week. They showed up with smiles, eager to explore every single week. They challenged themselves to improve their personal best, um, and it was uh, such a joy to watch that. They supported each other in frustrating times, and they were really sure to laugh a lot. Um, it has been an absolute joy to see them uh, see their hard work pay off like this. 
So um, I want to give a huge thank before I um, I want to recognize the kids. Uh, I first want to give a huge thanks to our incredible parent volunteers, the phenomenal Rotary Club, particularly Whit Hall, Al Catalini, and Mr. Clark Rosen, who's here today. Um, <clears throat> without their uh, material support and their just constant support and presence, this absolutely would not have happened. Um, and then the organizers at SCO who have cultivated this experience, um, this environment where you can look around all day long and kids are just grinning from ear to ear as they return from their events all day long. And so they've created that environment in which learning is the most important thing. It's really amazing. So um, we had uh, two teams this year, McKinley Black and McKinley Red, uh, fourth through sixth grade. We had 13 girls and nine boys. And um, Mr. Chair said, uh, it's not about first place or who won, but I'm gonna tell you about first place and who won right now. <laughs> so um, we had five, uh, between the two teams, we had five first place ribbons, uh, four second place ribbons, five third place ribbons, and four fourth place ribbons. McKinley Black came in first in the county, and McKinley Red came in fourth in the county out of 16 teams. So um, I want to call up the students. We have a huge showing here tonight. Um, and uh, so I want to call up McKinley Black. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to call them up in a second. Kids, will you come up? Just kind of line up and face the board this way. So um, Emma Malley, Loomis Blashin, Maya Skolnick, Lorelai Wright, Heidi <coughs> Kishani, Owen Pontoliero, uh, Ashlyn um, Bias, Josh Bias, Mira Bruce Lowe, Ever Abercrombie, and Ursula Longisto. That's McKinley Black. Come on up, guys. practice together, we work together, and really only the day of the event was there any kind of separation the whole time. So this is the second half of this team, of this winning team, is McKinley Red, and that is Rona Hansen, Eli Leventhal, Cammie Stinson, Madeline Wright, Hannah Molly, May McCarthy, Alan Sawyer, Camille Salas, Ben Liu, Ethan Eshu, and Neela Kelly. So come on up. Debbie Winkler, the president of the CSEA chapter number 212. We're going to do a presentation of the CSEA members of the core right now. So it seems really good. So everybody can just hold until we do the presentation, and we'll, we'll go ahead and give the students a chance to, to go. Seems really fitting that after honoring all of these students and their families and some teachers, that we would also honor someone who is supporting our students on a daily basis to ensure their success. So would you like to introduce our CSEA member of the quarter? Our CSEA member of the quarter is Pradesh Lai. I literally have pages of things that people have said about him. So a few of the, um, were, the uh, staff members at your site have said that you are always a positive attitude and you interact with students in a respectful manner regardless of which student it is or their behavior. They also said that you're always a friendly and welcoming smile on your face. You always have a, a friendly and welcoming smile on your face, greeting staff and students each morning as they arrive and waving a friendly goodbye as they leave. 
Mr. Lau's enthusiasm and thoroughness is unique and very much appreciated by all. He is friendly, dedicated to his position, shows pride in his work, and shows that he not only cares about his co-workers and fellow CSEA members, but all of the students in his community. He um, also was mentioned many times just helping out at the drop of a hat. And the staff there showed so much appreciation. We go before we come to you, we go to the site to let him know and they had a full spread out for him, and just all of them surprised him and were waiting for him. So he is very well appreciated at his site, and um, very well appreciated by the Congratulations. Thank you, like I said, it takes uh, all of us working together to, to get, uh, necessary um, let me say facilities amenities and the educational experience for the students so I will now allow the students and the families if you want to go you go you're free to stay and stay for the rest of the meeting but we'll take a little two-minute break so you have the opportunity if you want to go home I think the other people are going first. Yeah, so Amy's going first. Yeah. You're first. You're next on the agenda. Next. Yeah, go ahead and set up. Go ahead and uh, 
Well, I'm excited that we actually are adopting to start with, and I'm very excited that we um, chose everyday math because I've had some pretty reluctant math students this year who have really been enjoying math. Uh, they enjoy being able to talk with one another, talk their processes out, use different strategies with their math thinking and learning, and uh, what I just asked not that long ago what their favorite part of fourth grade has been so far, and that was on many of their lists. Awesome. And Amy, how about you? I know you kind of had some reservations in the beginning, right? I did, because their scope and sequence is unlike anything we are used to, and we really were unsure about their whole thinking behind the program. But after working on it for several months and watching the kids and seeing where, what direction um, they are taking, the kids are loving it. It makes complete sense. Um, most of the time, <laughs> and uh, I would hope you enjoy it. Great. All right, and Sandra, you said something really great about the process today, so will you just share with everybody kind of how our process has been? Right, this process I feel was the most positive experience I've had with the group committee in a long time. All voices were heard, all um, points of view were expressed, and the committee worked as a group, truly worked as a group to come to what we feel is a good decision. We worked to look at different curriculums, we visited sites, we had input from all grades, and I feel great about the process and the decision. All right, thanks ladies. trying to get teachers from every grade level and every site. Um, except Cherry Valley was the only school that didn't participate in this adoption because they, are, they didn't want to be part of the adoption process, this adoption process. Okay, so just a little about the committee. So upon final vote, um, we, in, we went back and forth on this. So 87% of, the, of the, the group agreed that everyday math was the best fit for our school district at the very end. 100% of the committee stands behind the process and adoption recommendation. So I just want to talk a little bit about the, the process. So we, um, we spent last year, so 2014-15, sort of towards the end in math committee, looking at, we did showcases, curriculum showcases. We looked at um, lots and lots of different uh, curricula. We settled on three. Um, after and over the summer, we did we did another showcase or two, and we settled on Eureka Everyday Math and Math Expressions. Each of them we thought would could potentially be a very good fit for our district. Um, the way we separated the, the three programs, we looked at each of the six elementary sites. We divided them up by grade level. So so every for example, Everyday Math, we wanted to make sure that Everyday Math somewhere in the district was being taught at kindergarten. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, same thing with the other programs. And then we moved the grade levels sort of um, each, so that each site had a different program. So that every single site had every single program at a different grade level. Really giving us a broad range across the different schools to see if the, whatever, whichever program we selected would be uh, the right program for us. At the very beginning, we created a rubric to say, this is our ideal program. Here's what it's going to contain. It's going to hit X, Y, and Z, all these different points of view. Um, we established some survey questions based off of the rubric that we could send out to all of the pilot teachers to kind of keep track of, um, get, get their feedback and make sure that they were heard. We then did some field work and observations. Um, we went out to some different, different school districts to look at their, how they were implementing the programs to make sure that we, were, we had all the same parts. We like, went out to different sites and um, pilot teachers as well as math committee members we're given um, a release day or two to go out and look at the different sites um, just to sort of get a feel for the, all, the, all the different programs so we knew what we were comparing and contrasting. And I think to jump in, um, it's not listed here, but we checked in with not only schools in our area and districts in our area, but we also did some Google Hangouts with some other principals and teachers in different places. Um, and then we also surveyed students. So we got student um, feedback as well, which was a really great idea the math committee had as well. 
Um, we and then we all met as an entire then sort of that last not last step, but we met as an entire K five um, all the K five teachers together. We um, wanted to make sure that everyone knew about the process, knew what we have we, what we've been doing, and got a chance to express their input. So. Um, we met as just the pilot teachers and then we brought it back out to grade level. So all the first and second grade, I think it was K-1, were together, two, three, were together, four, five, so that everyone could hear about all the programs and we could get all the teachers' feedback. We then brought this feedback and we had our, our most recent math committee meeting. Um, we took a sort of a temperature gauge to see where people were at and we did a final vote and 87% of the committee agreed that everyday math was the program for our district. With 100% with 100% of everyone saying, "Yeah, we we trust this process and we we all support it." And we then made that video and said, "Everybody, bring our things back to your sites, share it out, so that it's really clear um, that we stand behind this as a committee." Yeah, I think that's it. Here's our rubric for your info. Um, some strengths and highlights of the program, which we're going to leave this box here for you guys too, if you want to look at it later. Um, it's filled with um, games. Is a the games component of EDM is really. Um, critical to the learning for the students. So this is filled with fifth grade games. And um, that was something that we heard a lot from the pilot teachers, is that kids are having fun doing a lot of math. And so we always love to bring that into our classroom. So lots of games you guys can look through here as well. Um, and then, of course, like there's the traditional like homework book, um, but lots of conversations about what do we want that to look like for our students. Um, tons of activity cards and um, the, these these playing cards are, they start at a very young age and they go through all the different grades and are just like, the kids are having the most fun laughing, playing, doing all sorts of mental math that they don't even realize they're doing. Um, so feel free to look through that as well. Um, one of my teachers at Pengrove, Tracy Manaris, walked our teachers through the online planner, which was a huge hit with the teachers as well. Um, if you say you have a field trip one day, you can just click your little date and say field trip and it shifts all your lessons that you need and the materials that you need and so that was a big, um, a big hit with the teachers too because we did want to bring in that technology piece um, as well. So it's really fun that we have the kids playing games and being really active and then we also have that tech piece as well. So really excited about, um, about what we'll Seems be like doing in our classrooms. Seems like a realistic program as well. So 110 to 125 lessons per grade level so allows for some testing. Um, allows for a little bit of reteaching as well so that uh, we can make sure that all the, every student is getting through all the curriculum they're supposed to in their, in their grade. I think the family engagement was something that stood out as well. Um, and so each teacher having to create a little newsletter to share with parents about this is what we're doing. The program provides the same information, the same vocabulary for all the families. So that family engagement from the school connection uh, I think was really popular as well. So next we have, um, so in, in June 6th, we have two professional development days coming up, June 6th and June 7th. And June 6th, we're going to be doing um, everyday math is going to come and train all the teachers and all the TK through five, fifth grade teachers in the district. That's another thing. Is they have a TK program, which is great for um, four of our schools for next year. Um, but on June 6th, they're going to come and do a training by um, every, the K1, 2, 3, 4, 5 training with TK and K together. And then on June 7th, we're going to be breaking up. We're going to, we're going to stay, um, we're going to come back to McDowell and do a second day without EDM there to really sort of digest what we learned the day before. Um, we're then going to, you know. Yeah, I just, I think that one thing our committee um, really felt was important was that we don't just throw a new program at everyone mm -hmm. and that we really wanted to spend next year and beyond but really training our teachers. And so um, we're looking and planning for um, five, P five full PD days for all of our K-5 teachers, which is huge. Um, that pretty much will fill our PD calendar for next year. So um, with your approval, we're excited to move forward on that. I think from just seeing for myself as a, a, a brand new parent to Petaluma City Schools with my daughters in the TK program, I and having that principal hat on as well, but past couple of years not having a, um, a curriculum that we've been following or even common assessments, this is really important for me, <coughs> for my students and for my own daughter um, and all my students in the entire school that we have some, some common assessments and a, and a common curriculum that we're all following to make sure that we're, we're teaching, giving our students the best education we can. 
So with yeah, your approval, that's what, that's what we're looking to do adopt an everyday map. We were really excited to do this to our teachers as well because I think there was a lot of skepticism that we could, in a year, have a successful pilot and find a program that was best for our district. So, high five. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Can you wait, hold on, do you yeah. have any questions? Yes. Um, so is there a textbook associated with everyday math, or is it an e-textbook, or just a... There's a couple different components. So like every student has, um, like this is a student reference book. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, and Sandra, did you, you piloted EDM, right? Yes, I'm doing so, right now. So there is, there's an in-class math journal, correct? Yes. Which is, looks a lot like this. Then there's the home links book. Um, then there is the student reference book, which has lots of the games and such in there, right? Yeah, vocabulary all and all of that good stuff. And then um, they're actually in April, they're releasing a new tech component. So I don't know if it's already come out this month or if it's at the end of the month. But um, there, there, are, there is supposed to be a new technology component that we haven't seen yet, which we were excited about too. So there'll be a class set of the textbook or whatever you called it. Every student can drive will get the book and the and games for the yeah and the classroom as well. Okay. Um, and it's common core aligned. Cut everyday math. No, no, my name I can say that. It wasn't it's not true. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and you brought up district wide assessments. Will we continue to do those district wide assessments or will um, well, we and I think too I just want to backtrack one second so that we also wanted to look, part of our rubric was to find something that was aligned. So once they get, students get to sixth grade, they're, it's per, well, you know, they're well prepared for college prep math, moving up into sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way through 12th grade. Um, and then the question was about the oh, assessments. Oh, district-wide assessments? We'll, we'll probably continue. use what the program provides, yeah. um, is my guess. The math committee will be working on that. In, and with guidance from the EDM trainers as well. But that was something that, you know, why would we spend a lot of time creating a lot of things? With, you know, we're going to see what this what this can offer us. And I think that was the the concern in the past was we had um, we were really looking for some common assessments, and the teachers we did a fantastic job. I mean, they were incredible. But we're not we're not test builders. We're yeah. not curriculum writers. This, curriculum writers. This is this is a solid program that we can use the benchmark assessments to them and it's very you know it's all aligned to what they're learning so first grade um, first trimester benchmark assessment will be aligned with what they're supposed to be doing in class so we can get some real common data that we can then share across different schools and have rich conversations about about the data how about differentiation tons of that especially through the games i personally have um gone into fifth grade about probably 10 times this year and while the teacher's doing a whole group lesson or some, and there's some reteaching that I'll have a group in the corner and we're doing a game. And so we're working on some of that. So lots of opportunities for differentiation across a variety of groups. And the first teacher you saw speaking was Carrie Bailey, third grade teacher over at McDowell. And um, I was in her classroom quite a bit as well. She was piloting EDM. And a lot of some scaffolding for English language learners as well. Some, there are other components in there for that. Um, and finally, what are we doing with Envision? Envision will become our past program and we'll probably collect it up. Usually what happens to old textbooks that we've had, these are very well-loved textbooks because we've had Envision for a long, long time. Um, we usually um, send them to um, other countries. There's a, a company that we work with and we send them off to other countries to be used in. We might be able to sell some of them back to follow it, we'll see, because they're like the old, old edition. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. If we can, we will sell them, and then we also uh, work with this company that um, sends them off to, to some undeveloped countries. So, and just thank you for your time. It sounds like a committee worked hard and crudely and cooperatively. So I appreciate that, and it sounds like our students will be well taken care of next year on the math class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we'll go to uh, item 8.5, a presentation by Molly Nagel, Special Services Co-Director Zarella uh, Hortman, Workability Teacher, and Victoria McCormick, Workability Instructional Assistant on the Pelham City Schools Workability Program. Hold on. 
And the only time they ever brought up special ed was when they said, and all our kids passed, you know, did, did all the testing except for the special ed students. They didn't make their, you know, didn't meet their requirements. So it was always the ESL and special ed that they'll, they would bring up, but they'd also always bring it up in a negative way. You know, they didn't meet the requirements for the you know, state test. And then ESL went away, and they started making their goals, and still special ed didn't. So I just want to let you guys know that you know, special ed is population, you know, they're from here all the way up here. And we have, you know, kids that are really intelligent, that are on the spectrum, but, and then we have kids here that really have a hard time just functioning in life. So um, our mission is to promote the involvement of key stakeholders, which means everybody that's involved with that student. Um, the IEP team, which is the teachers, workability staff, counselors, parents, the students themselves, if they uh, have Department of Rehab Services, anybody that provides services, those are the key stakeholders. So we work with them to develop a plan so that when our students graduate high school, that they're prepared for whatever comes next. And um, we do work training and work experience with our students, so we help students get jobs out in the community. And um, did you guys get my little brochure here? Yeah. So this kind of explains what we do. On the back, it shows you all the different employers we've worked with. And actually, this is kind of old. We haven't updated this in several years. And so that's one of the goals we're having for next year. It's in the process. Uh, what's that? It's in the process. It's in the process. Um, also, we had, um, every year, we, get, we have to write an end of the year report from the state of California. And um, so we get the results after they, they have a couple of readers read the report and they rate the school district. And I'm happy to say the past two out of the three years, we have received perfect 27s, which are threes in all nine categories. So they cover um, recruitment, so recruiting our students, you know, and so you have to tell how you recruit students to the program, assessment, how we assess the students, um, counseling, what we do with counseling, how we counsel the students for jobs, pre-employment skills training, anyways, all these different areas, we got a perfect um, 27 on the thing. So I'm very proud of our, um, our staff. Our SP uh, teachers are really important in this whole process because um, when we develop this Google Classroom, we go in, we do a training with the teachers and the kids, and then it's up to the teachers to provide these transition services to their students. So we have a lot of resources, and I'm going to show you a little bit on some of the things that we have for the students to do. Um, so we do work training, work experience, and then um, history. We started in 1987 in workability here in the district. They served 32 students and replaced six students. So that was, that was a good beginning. And the budget was $7,800. So we received $7,800 from CDE, who is actually uh, doing this. And the other thing is, this is the longest grant program in the state of California. Um, it's been running for how many years now? Um, since 80, 85 it's been going. Um, and this year, $39 million goes to the school districts. And there are 300 school districts and uh, Office of Education that offer workability <coughs> out of about 900. So about a third of the schools in California or districts have workability programs. Um, uh, we went to a meeting last week, and they might have more funding next year, but they said that the funding is only going to go to new programs because they want to offer the same opportunity to other school districts. So they used to give us, um, when money was good, they used to give us raises every year and more money. In the past four or five years, we've been kind of settled with that. Um, so um, that year, uh, 2015, so we served uh, 32 kids in 87. Now we served 321 students this year. So that's quite a bit of difference with the same amount of staffing. So it's just been me and Vicki, and when I started in 94, it was me and another person, another teacher, and we're still doing the same thing, except we're serving over 300 more kids. So um, it's pretty amazing what we do out there, and uh, you know, I really appreciate everything that this school district does for us. The other thing is because of um, my salary goes up, benefits go up, and because workability hasn't gone up as far as funding, the past few years, um, the district has given some money back to <coughs> workability to help you know, maintain our program. One of the things with statement assurances from the state of California says you have to maintain your program at the present level. 
So if we were to cut the program, um, cut staffing or something like that, we would actually be going against the statement of assurances. So I, I just hope and pray that you guys will continue funding for anything that's excess of what we get from the state. Um, we do off-campus placements, and right now we have 94 students that are working off-campus out of 321 kids that we serve. 25% um, is what the goal is for the state of California, and we're like 30-some percent as far as placing our students. And we've always been above that. So we have students working everywhere from grocery stores to fast food, um, <coughs> schools, uh, boys and girls club, anything where you, any place you can see a student working, we have students working. Um, and you wouldn't even know it. You wouldn't know they were a special ed student. They get a lot of training. We make sure that when they go to a job that they know how to do an interview. Uh, we have them prepared by doing resumes, filling out practice job applications. So um, we make sure that when they go to, to interview for that job that they're prepared and ready to go. And I've had employers come to me and say, God, you know, you kids nailed it. They had the interview down, they had a nice resume, and we have adults that are 30 and 35 years old that came in, they looked slobby, they you know, didn't have a resume, your kids shine. And it just makes me so proud. And the other thing i got to say is when a kid gets a job, man, does that make us feel good, Vicki? Sometimes we see a kid in front of us change their lives when they get a job. A kid that looks down and out, that you know, is arguing with their parents, they're arguing with their friends, they're getting all F's in school, they're turning to drugs. All of a sudden they get a job. They start relating with their parents much more. They start relating with their friends much more. And it just, for me, I mean, that's the greatest part of the job is to see these kids get a job and see their life change. Life changing is what it is. And the other thing we do is we follow up one and two years after high school. And we, we legally, we have to make sure that these kids are um, being placed in, in, in the right position. And we have found with the follow-up calls that 80% of our students are either going to the JC or some type of training or college, and or working. Um, so, and, and the reason I started Workability was in 84, 85, they did this, they took 100 school districts and they followed the kids for two years and they found that 70% of the students were not working or were not going to school. And now the numbers have turned around. 70% of the state of California Workability students are either working or going to school after high school. And that is why they've been funding it for all these years. It's, it's a great program. Um, so Google Classroom. So then the last thing that we do is for our seniors, we, we make sure that they connect with the junior college. So there's something called the Transition to College. And it's offered by the Santa Rosa Junior College. Me and Vicki, the counselors at the two high schools, or all the high schools actually, um, make sure that our kids sign up for the program. In the fall, they have to um, register for the JC, so we go online and get them their student ID numbers. Then they have to attend an orientation at the junior college, so they have a little checklist of all the things they have to do. Then they have to go take the placement test in the springtime. And then after all that, they get to meet their counselor in May or June, and they get to take their, um, uh, they get priority scheduling in the fall, so our kids, get first schedule of all the classes at the JC. And that's just a wonderful selling point for our kids. Um, it's just fantastic. Um, I have to do the end of the year report. Um, we have to do a budget with that. So we supply a budget. We have to have a statement of assurances saying from our wonderful superintendent saying that we agree that we're going to do all these things that the, the program says. And um, what else? I'm just walking, talking away. I wanted to show you a little about what we do with the students. So, so just do one of your resources. You yeah. Just click on that button right there. Double click on it. See, I don't. I don't have one of these. I have a Chromebook, so it's a different animal to yeah. me. And I this is, this is Apple, right? Yeah. yeah. And so if I look like I don't know what I'm doing, I don't. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, okay, so transition interviews. This is one of the first things we do with our students. We want to make sure that our teachers and workability staff know um, something about our students. So it asks, uh, what career are you considering? 
what kind of training or education you think you're going to want, the interest experiences, the favorite classes, um, the work history. So it's a two-page document, and it kind of just gives us a baseline of where our students are at as far as the job are concerned. I am really sorry. State of California is you have to um, document all the activities that students do in transition. Um, so when a kid finishes the activity, they put the name of the activity there, the date they started it, and the date they completed it. The State of California comes in and says, I want to look at Jimmy Jones' uh, um, portfolio, his uh, transition portfolio. They can go to this, they can show them um, what date they did what, and make sure that they have completed what they need to complete. Middle tab. Uh -huh. Go over to the left, left, right, right click. And then go over to the left again. Go to your next document, your activity book. Um, okay, so one of the things we have is a sample job application. So we kind of um, went to Google class, Google, and they had just a sample application that you can do. Here's the, the usual um, employment history, that sort of thing. One thing I got to say about the technology, new technology, really is kind of negative for our RSP students, our special ed students in general. Um, maneuvering through some of these online applications, I don't know if you guys have recently done it. But some of them actually take an hour to an hour and a half to complete for a regular person. So if you want to get a special ed student to do this, sometimes it takes me two class periods to get through one application. It used to take me 20 to 30 minutes to do it by paper. So in one respect, you know, technology is great, but it also can you know, slow things down or make things not go as good. Ah. Go to the left again, go to the second tab. Go to the left again, find the job. Okay, personal career profile. So they do a bunch of different activities on this website. There's a bunch of different um, websites they go to. And then they come up with my dreams for the future. So the three areas where they want to work, what the career they want, what kind of um, education do they want, or training do they want, and what are their plans for where they want to live or what they want to do. Then we do a values inventory. There's an inventory in there that they do values, work values, what's important than work. What do you think the number one answer is? Why people want to work? Money. Money, Money yes, okay. So almost every kid I've ever had says, gave that answer. One kid gave me a one-page paragraph with a bunch of BS, just wrote all this stuff, and never included money. I go, this kid is so full of it, I can't believe it. Um, and my best intelligence, so they do an intelligence survey. Um, there's like 10 ways you can be smart, so the kids kind of find out which ways they are smart. And then they can use that both at school and at work, so they can tell their employer, you know, I, this, I learned this way, or I'm this type of smart, and same with, thing with their teachers. Um, learning style, we learn three different ways. We learn by seeing, hearing, and doing. So if the students are aware, we can do a, a, a survey. The kids, um, most of the kids are aware of, of how they learn best. And our special ed students especially, how do you think they learn best? Seeing, hearing, or doing? Doing. 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 Probably eight out of 10, they all come up with doing. And I must have been a special ed kid when they didn't have special ed, because that's how I learn. And I can relate to a lot of the students I work with. Um, work experience, the work environment, what kind of work environment they want to work in, the conditions, top three career interests. Um, I'm not going to show you the rest of this because, you know, time-wise. But believe me, there's like 15 different activities the kids do, job interest surveys, and uh, they do a budgeting one, which is really good. Another great one is uh, my, big, uh, my big future, it's called. 
and it's a, it's a um, college website, and it's wonderful for like teachers, for kids that are younger, they kind of have them explore different colleges, and the ones that are ready to graduate, they actually have them go to this site of the schools they're interested in, and it tells all kinds of stuff. It tells you what the, the culture of the campus is, how much the tuition is, what the major, you know, um, the majors that are the strongest majors in the school, and then they compare schools so that kids can do comparisons, see how much it costs, and so our seniors are really getting a lot out of this, and the teachers are coming up and saying, thank you for that website, and this is wonderful. Um, and so I had my doubts about this, to be honest, when I first started the Google Classroom, because all my life I've been a paper and pencil type of guy, and all of a sudden, you know, this new thing was hitting me, and yeah, but I have to say that um, I'm definitely going towards technology, and um, I'm actually pretty proud of what I've done. <laughs> and um, I don't know. That's kind of it. Just any questions you guys have? Any questions? A lot of information, and not any questions. Just your your passion is amazing. Especially to be doing something for so long and love it so that it's like it's like you just got the job yesterday and you're so excited about it. Vicky <laughs> <laughs> and Mike may both feel the same way. And today I actually did a follow-up phone call on a kid and um, that called a student and she is actually at Chico. So she's a seat, she's a freshman at Chico. We have to follow up one in two years. She's doing great. She's also working part-time as a nanny while she's going to school there. And she wanted me to thank her RSP teacher, and she wants to get in the child development too. So she wants me to share that. So it's great. Uh, we get it from both ends. We see them in high school when they, you know, get their job, and then we see them, you know, hear from them after high school and see what they're doing with their lives. And there's some amazing stories. And I would, I would, uh, can you testify for a minute? To, oh, we have. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest parts of my job, of course, is placing students in the community and have really put a lot of energy into placing some of our students in some of the grammar schools to have them assisting the teachers, um, especially in our kindergarten at Valley Vista because it's really working out well. Our students can walk over there during the, you know, during the class period and we're fortunate because part of our program with the state funding is to be able to pay our kids so we can pay them for the training. And so that's, some of that's going to change next year because now our students that like go to Valley Vista and work in the classroom as an aide are getting school credits and they're also getting paid. Um, next year, they're not going to be able to get the school credits, but we still will be able to pay them because our grant funding provides for that. And so we have one of our kindergarten teachers here who's, um, some of our greatest success stories have been um, because we do the pre-employment screening to be able to find where our students will fit, um, have had some opportunities to put some incredible kids and watch them just grow, just develop. And I can't thank you enough. <laughs> You're going to stand up for a minute? Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> yourself and, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. Everything you're saying is true. Oh, I'm Andrea Newfeld. I teach over at uh, Valley Vista Kindergarten, and um, yeah, I call Vicki the beginning of every year. Hey, do you have anybody that you can, you know, float our way? And they bring a couple of kids, and uh, it's wonderful every year. It's wonderful. It's great. And it's so neat to watch them because as when we started a few years ago, especially, um, we would take the students that I that I would be able to hand pick and say, okay, let's try this student, and then. They would say to me, you know, the student needs the kindergartners as much as the kindergartners right. need them because they're an instant hero when they That's walk right. in. That's right. Rock stars, they walk in, I sit down at the Lego table, start playing, and start talking to the kids, and they, they fall into line. So we really appreciate it. We wanted to send you some pictures too. Yeah. The big kids playing with the little kids. Oh, and so if I had my way about presenting about our program, I probably would have brought the students and had them talk to you about you know, the success stories that I've seen just in the almost 10 years that I've been doing it. Our students that started working in the cafeteria on campus at Paloma High School and then went on to work at Taco Bell and then started on the line and then became managers and now I can call them and, and have our students working for them. And our students that were working and um, now are working at Oil Stop and are managers and I can call them and say I've got students and you know what we do and, and we send them to you prepared and it's exciting. So, can't, 
can't thank you enough for offering this opportunity to our And we do have a passion for this. <laughs> thank you. We love our team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then we will um, ask that you go ahead and you um, bear in mind, after we the admonishment in this, that you bear in mind that you get to talk to us. We listen. Don't take the fact that we don't ask questions or dialogue with you as disinterest. It's just the way it works. And so public comment is meant for you to share what uh, your concerns with the district are with us. So, Hayden um, Kashani, if you'd like to come up. So, good evening. And I'd just like to address a public comment to the board about the recently tightened internet filtering policies and I do realize that of course some kids there are some kids who are naturally going to try and look up inappropriate things on the internet and of course we need to defend against that but now when things are being blocked because of general travel society dot politics or directory or high school, we're beginning to see a trend of overblocking and fear, also some extra, basically, not wanting to bring the internet out and bring technology out to the students. Like in Spanish class, for example, we were recently doing an essay on world hunger and like, you know, none of us are fluent in Spanish in Spanish class, except for those of Hispanic descent. Most of them speak fluent Spanish. But for me, even, I was typing in Spanish, but there were always some words that I needed to look up, and for some students, they needed to translate their whole essay, but they couldn't use Google Translate, and they couldn't translate their essays. Also, when I was looking up the origin of strawberries, it took me like 15 minutes to find out that they were from France. So with all of this extreme blocking of various categories and the whole blanket block where they don't look and clearly pick out the different grade levels and responsibilities of each student and I feel that we can there is always a solution to this problem where we can move towards it. And I recently wrote an email to our director of technology, Lori Dean, and I got a nice response. And I appreciate the fact that she and her team are working towards moving towards this solution. I'd just like to inform you, and in our class, I have a lot of support, and even many teachers are backing this movement. And also, YouTube is one of the most important sources that we need. And we can set up YouTube for schools. I, would, I suggest that as a consideration, because there are a lot of educational videos on YouTube. And with YouTube for schools, if we set it up, it can make it so that it forces us to watch those cat videos at home and <laughs> watch those MIT videos at school. <laughs> and also, there's also the thing where even no matter how hard you try and constrain it, there will always be a method that students will find access and this might actually cause implosion where soon the board notices that the filter isn't even functioning in certain ways, where the students, they took the time of all of this concentration on blocking various categories that don't seem that to need to block, and the students, they will push around the whole thing. And for a while, even, even amongst teachers, there's this whole thing of don't ask, don't tell, just show, 
where some students start downloading YouTube videos using another method, and it actually helped our class because we saw things like one of my one of my classmates did a project on Rubik's cubes, so we showed videos of fastest solved Rubik's cubes in the world, and I think that we can't live without having these important tools in our classroom. And if CNN is unblocked, then why is Visit Dubai blocked? And why is Weebly blocked? Why is Google Translate blocked? If we have the various leading news sources unblocked, there is possibly more content that some parents don't want their kids to see on sites like NY Times and CNN than on Google Translate, Weebly, etc. So just a suggestion to the board to please reconsider the extreme blocking. And I know some parents might want it, but this is democracy. And I feel that just because a few parents speak up, if they are severely outnumbered, we can also reach a consensus. We don't have to make it so that the majority is just represented. We can always just reach a consensus. And I, please, I implore you to help us in reaching this consensus where we can have a safe and educational environment for these kids. Thank you. Thank you. I am here. That was very good. You're up. <laughs> oh. What? Perfect timing. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to now call up um, Heather Gallagher, uh, reducing radiation from tech devices. Hi, I'm new to the Pennsylvania City Schools. My daughter, my name is Heather Gallagher, and my daughter is from Cherry Valley. She, her name is Athena Gallagher. She's a first grade student there, and it's our first year through Cherry Valley. We started at North Bay Children's Center and got accepted this year in Cherry Valley. Um, anyway, I have recently found out the reason I'm here today is to um, reduce the radiation exposure to young children, especially in the middle of the city schools specifically because that's where I am. And I just recently found out some hazards that were brought to my attention um, right before Easter break. And I decided to discuss with the t my daughter's teacher and the principal. And now I'm here to discuss with you guys, but basically just bring it to your attention that I would like to be on the agenda, hopefully for the next board meeting, and discuss in detail about um, teach mainly I want to teach the teachers how to teach the children safe practice with the devices because I feel that the devices are being used kind of in, not in, inappropriately per se but without safety hazards in mind like uh, the other day um, I'm a teacher for the students for gardening on Fridays and the other day I was in the classroom waiting for the, the students to come out and one of the teachers said we're going to hand the devices to each one of you guys and I want you to place it in your lap and leave it in your lap until we have further instruction and that immediately alarmed me because when I read my cell phone because I have a, a smartphone it said all technical devices use caution and hold them like 20 centimeters away from your body because they can cause radio radiation to your body. So that was very alarming because these devices, I found out, are always having Bluetooth on and that's a, a problem to have Bluetooth and all the wireless radiation <coughs> pumping into their bodies constantly. Uh, ra radiating their body all day while they're at school because the tablets are always on. And that, that's another safe problem that I, I have an issue with is the fact that the tablets are always on and they're not ever being turned off and they're not 
being properly, I, I feel, stored and charged. Uh, there's, I have many concerns, like, uh, specifically, um, the, ra the routers also in the classroom are constantly, there's two industrial strength routers in my daughter's classroom, and there's 40 tablets in her classroom because she shares a classroom with another class. And just all of that magnitude of radiation is something that hasn't been tested. I actually talked to the principal to see if possibly they could test the room and see how much radiation is in that space. And she said that it wasn't a possibility, which seemed kind of alarming to me that it wouldn't be a possibility to see whether or not it's a safe thing to have in the school because it's my understanding that schools are supposed to keep our children safe. Um, that's what I've learned from the educational code that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with to keep safety in, in, in schools. And if there's evidence that there is radiation exposure, which I've read from the um, World Health Organization and other cases. I mean, the more you research it, the more you can figure out the information. I actually sent a, some information to Michael Badley today and a few days ago, and um, it's because my boss would gave me your name and said, hey, you, use Mike and give him some information before you speak. And I just, I just want to make everybody aware that I mean, I love technology. I think it's great. I've excelled at technology. I just know that there's safe ways to handle technology, especially in young children, because their bodies are more susceptible to the radiation than our bodies are. And um, I know now, too, being <coughs> pregnant, I'm three months pregnant, that uh, it's also more damaging to my, my baby to actually be exposed long term. So I actually got rid of my cell phone wired my house recently so that it's all hardwired instead of wireless. I mean, I know there's exposure everywhere. I mean, in here, look, everybody's got laptops. I mean, they're all on, irradiating, and I know that that's dangerous for me to be in the room with my baby. And um, I just want to reduce exposure. That's my main objective. I'll discuss more in detail, hopefully, next time. Thank you. Okay. We have another uh, Heather, Heather Elliott Hudson, who wants to speak uh, on SROs on our high school campuses. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm Heather Elliott Hudson. I'm the co founder of Pelham Parents Against Drugs. And we are a fairly new organization formed about two and a half months ago after my uh, friend, one of the co founder, um, we had an experience with her son that hit us between the eyes with the drug crisis at our schools and our campuses at Paloma and Paloma. Um, when that was proposed to us, we discussed that we can't sit around and just watch this go on anymore. We've got to do something. With that, we have met with so many people, some of you on this board, um, school, uh, school members. Um, we're working with Eric Backman at Casa Grande. We're currently in conversations with Mr. Sturrett over at Paloma High, Chief Williams and all of his staff. We've got seats at tons of tables, and our biggest concern right now is we are hoping to get the SROs back on our high school campuses. We understand that we've had them in the past, they were a really positive influence in our kids' lives and still are. And we need them back on our campus because the kids are at a point where we have some great programs with um, Mr. Dave Rose and his staff who are dealing with kids who are currently in crisis. And we need to get those kids that are kind of sitting on the fence that maybe aren't falling off yet. 77% of our kids might be trying to maybe dabble in drug and situations like that. So we have a five-prong kind of focus for the next year. Um, two, actually three of them are with the schools, meeting with communication between the um, schools and the parents. Because it's not just educating the kids, it's educating us. You know, us parents don't know enough to be dangerous, and we think we know a little, but we don't know enough. 
So we need to really focus on getting in front of the parents and let the parents know that this is a situation that is not in our backyards anymore. It's, it's sleeping in the room next to you. Um, so I propose to be put on the agenda for our next meeting that we can have a conversation a little bit deeper on the SROs and hopefully getting them back on campuses as soon as possible. We understand it's a budget situation, totally get that. Um, we know that we have 100% support from pretty much everybody in, in agreement that we know we need this. So we need to find the money and whether it's gonna come from school board, city, police, we need to fundraise, we're gonna do it. So we just need to all work together and try to find this money and see to keep our kids safe on campuses. It's not just about drugs and alcohol, but about keeping them keeping them safe and, and out of harm's way. So I ask that you put us on the agenda for the next meeting, and I thank you for your time. Um, Eric Hoffman, DHS Full Status. Good evening, Eric Hoffman, 101 Douglas Street, your neighbor across the street. And uh, I come to uh, make some brief comments on the uh, pedal in the pool and its status. Um, basically, uh, the, the pool right now is empty, which is probably good because it was leaking, allegedly several thousand gallons a day in, in, a, in a drought. That's not a good deal. Uh, my perspective is purely that of the high school swim coach, which I am this year for the first year. Um, it, I do not presume to address any of the other user groups, the wonderful aqueducts or the adult education, the high school PE program. Um, I'm going to talk purely about the high school swim team. Um, I know that there is a special meeting on Thursday, and on the agenda is a facilities workshop specifically addressing the pool. Unfortunately, the timing is not great because that is our SCL swimming championship, and I will be uh, have swimmers in the water at the JC. So I will not be able to attend that meeting. We're probably going to go till about into the evening because it's going to be a long day at the first day of the meet. Um, so unfortunately, I won't be able to be here. I did prepare something in writing, which I can leave if that's appropriate. Um, I'll say that regardless of the long-term solution for the high school swim pool, and I obviously have my opinions, um, and I'm the foremost expert on my own opinion, as we used to say on the radio, um, so I can speak from that, that aspect, that the, uh, there needs to be something in place, contingency planning, for next year and the following year, because anything that has to do with infrastructure takes time. And regardless if we had $5 million land on our head tomorrow, getting something done, depending on the scope of the work, is going to take some time. So my concern is that next February 1st, on or about which the start of the spring athletic season will be will, will be upon us, we have a place for the Petaluma High School team and the Casa Grande team to put swimmers in lanes and, and have them work out. Just on that subject, we have a very young team this year. We have 25 swimmers, I think 16 of them are freshmen. They have wonderful enthusiasm. Uh, they complement the, the, the more senior swimmers we have in the junior and senior ranks. Um, and I'd hate to see that momentum get killed. I think we did lose a few this year because there was uncertainty about the pool. There was uncertainty about the coach because I only got brought on board about a week before the season started. Um, I've sent them out uh, and told them that when they leave uh, the swim season this year, they're going to recruit next year's class and bring another 15 or 16 freshmen in. If we don't have a place to swim or there's uncertainty about that on the start of the first day of school, that's not going to help our efforts. So um, I'm just putting it out there that a contingency plan, short term, and I say short term, a year or two, needs to be in place to, to do that, whether that be the Federal and the Swim Center, whether that be working on a uh, short term solution for the Federal and the High Pool while the district works on a long term solution for, for a swimming pool, something. But I'm very concerned that next February 1st, uh, Petaluma and Casa have a place to swim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next, um, Paul McGavin. Um, uh, responsible iPad use and customers. 
That's topic one, and the other topic that we're going to be talking about is the, uh, the lack of the Petaluma City School District's goodwill and intentions towards engaging on this topic. Because I've experienced quite a stonewall from our superintendent that I would like to address in this meeting to hopefully re-engage in a conversation that's important about how we go about and solve these problems. Because these are important problems to solve. So is this just one topic or you're separating these topics? They're both involved because we're trying to engage in conversation and we're getting stonewalled. So let me tell you the experience that I've been having. On February 24th, wait, wait, wait. 2016. Wait, wait, wait. I'm just trying to figure out how much time to give you. Five. So he gets five minutes. I'm responsible. I can do some classrooms, and then it sounds like you have a separate matter about engagement. Lack of engagement on that issue okay. with the district. Okay. So, so it's the same issue. Same issue. I'll take five minutes. Of course. Okay. okay. So on February 24th, 2016, I sent you an email to this effect and asking you to engage in conversation. Response zero. I follow up with an email to you asking for a personal meeting, February 28th. We're waiting for an answer back. I hear provisionally back, and I shake your hand on March 7th. That was the day that I saw your interview for the new board position. And I want to welcome you to the board. I was very impressed with your interview, so I'm glad that you're serving. But I, we shook hands. I looked you straight in the eye and said, we're looking forward to seeing on March 30th myself and some other parents. And you agreed and shook my hand. I thought, fine, no problems. I followed up with a, an email on March 8th saying that we're going to have this meeting. I felt very good because it's been three years really since I started my education with the district and we have a new superintendent and he deserves to understand what happened three years ago and two years ago so he can actually guide this district in the best way they can to be able to get a good solution for everyone so we can take advantage of the iPads that we spent four million dollars on and we can actually implement it in a way that is safe and consistent with California Education Code. You have certain requirements, K through six, that you are not following, that you must follow, and you're also not putting in proper signage for warnings that you need in seven through 12. These have to be addressed. What did I get from you then? A, a, a message back saying, oh, I gotta change the time and maybe the parameters of the meeting. And I responded back, sure, we'll, we'll change the time, but don't wanna change the parameters. We have important parents that wanna sit down and talk with you. In the midst of trying to get you to call me back, he writes a letter on March 17th, canceling the meeting. I don't understand. We had a meeting confirmed, and it was fully canceled. We would like, we wrote a letter back, saying if there was a misunderstanding or any problems with this, please let us re-engage, because this is a discussion that is important to be had at the highest level, superintendent, and with the board as well. It is no longer time to stick our heads in the sand and pretend this isn't a problem. It is truly a problem. So let me tell you what this is. Parents, if your students have any of these symptoms in classrooms, the symptoms happen during the school day, but they go away at night, or they go away on the weekends, these are the big, big warning signs. Pretty mild symptoms, but very important to pay attention to. Typical allergy symptoms, additional mucus, Asthma, shortness of breath, blood sugar fluctuations, difficulty concentrating, distorted hearing or tinnitus ringing in the ears, which I feel right here in this room, erratic heart rate, frequent chronic illness, headaches, migraines, hyperactivity, learning problems, memory loss, mood behavior problems, muscle aches and spasms, numbness, tingling, skin rashes, sleep difficulties. These are all very well-known, identified symptoms of radiation sickness. This is in the physician's desk reference. This is not debated. This is easily diagnosed by qualified physicians, such as Dr. Toral Jelter, J-E-L-T-E-R, phone number 925-935-5425. Dr. Jelter is qualified to diagnose your children so they no longer have to be subjected to radiation sickness caused by what? The Petaluma City School District, with no regard to student health and safety, because they cut it out of their technology plan back in 2013, against all the objections of the parents, they decided to purchase and configure and use equipment in such a way 
that it leads to continuous, immediate, and latent toxic hazards in the classroom. We have in every single classroom continuous, immediate, and latent toxic hazards that must be addressed. We can't stick our heads in the sand about this anymore. We are threatening the fertility of our youngest children when they become adults. These young girls who come to school have all of the eggs they're ever going to be given at birth. This penetrates their abdomen, they're holding their iPads right here, and it is affecting the eggs in the ovaries. And you will not find out about this until 20 years from now. We see it already in three and four mice generations. Dr. Hugh Taylor from Yale University has published this work in 2013. You have all gotten links to it, and you choose to ignore this. This is a disaster in the making that can and should be addressed. How? Very simply and very intelligently by just saying we need to use our iPads and we need to configure them so that they are used better. We need these, a simple adapter on every iPad. And that will allow you to connect to a wired Ethernet network and it will take all of the radiation exposure hazards away. And this is required for K through 6 classrooms in order to comply with California Education Code, which does not allow a group to be carcinogen, which this is and has been since May of 2011. Thank you very much for please engaging in a conversation about this. We would love to truly educate you on what's happening and let us solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to. Um, that's all the public comments. We're going to take a brief break, and then we'll come back and uh, get into the uh, rest of the agenda. Thank you. There's two. These are all the cars.
Services vendor meeting, a Bay Science uh, Leadership Conference, and PHS meetings with facilities. I just have a one comment regarding the um, yeah. Bay Science Leadership mm -hmm. Convention yeah, I right. attended oh, okay. yesterday. If, no, Monday, sorry. Yeah. In Berkeley. Um, <laughs> we spent a lot of the schools has been involved in for probably close to 10 years, Jane? Uh, yeah. And Mr. Noble was there. And it's a pretty incredible program um, that we've been partnered with, but my concern is going forward that the new assessments are being right now worked on, so it's going to go into effect I believe 17, 18 million. <coughs> so I feel like if we could ask at some point to get a report on the agenda of what's going on with science in our district, and I know it's in the LCAP. Um, I know we've been very focused on math and ELA, but I think science needs to get to the forefront because there's new assessments coming down the pipe and it just has to be a part of the conversation, what we're doing at Pelham City Schools in regard to science. So in the next couple meetings, that would be helpful to have an update from science committee or base I. When would be the best time to do that? <laughs> um, 
Any, we can, let's look at the agendas and make sure we find one that has oh, a little space on yeah, it. Don't, don't slow sorry. down now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just add one more thing. Maybe we'll be here until midnight. And we notice it because we're into the next year. Can you ask Bayside when they would be available? Do you want Bayside? Or oh, they don't. Maybe Mrs. Franklin. Or, we get yeah, Kirsten. Yeah. Yeah. We actually did a, a, a little report last year, if the board remembers. We did a report probably about this time last year. Right. And so we can update at that from that. Probably going to have to be the second meeting in May. We can do that. Seven, Things are going to start backing up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Start? Or June. I can see you already starting to let the, the water out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think June would yeah. be fine as well. I mean, just sort of what we're preparing for the next year. Yeah, it's just that we have a LCAP presentation, and that's going to, oh. that'll. That's going to take some time. That'll take some time. OK, so we, well, you guys can work on it. But we also have. Um, uh, a green schoolyard. There was a green schoolyard meeting at Valley Vista that was attended. So, was there any other comments or activities from the board? I went to the Screenagers um, showing oh. at Petaluma High School last night. It was fabulous. Mr. Strat did an amazing job, and I highly recommend that every parent in the district see that show. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of parents ask about that, and it was a little too late to get them out there. It was the, it's the hottest thing going in yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. yeah, can you? There's another show. There's, there's another show. show in May on the 11th. <laughs> no. um, PDF and Grant have partnered, and we are can, showing it at the Boulevard. Could you yeah. contact oh, wow. your parent, Keller Kelly Vanderbeek? Yeah. Yeah. Let her let because she she's going to contact you. I've already directed her to you because she wants a screening at Grant. May 11th. Mary, go ahead. Right, what, what the Screen Agers movie is about, it's, it's, first off, it's really the hottest thing going in parent education right now in, in all levels of schools. It talks about the effects of any screen time on our kids. And it, not just, it doesn't just talk about you know, our kids spending too much time on, on an iPad or a cell phone. It, it walks us through families and what they what they've done about that. Walks us through kids who have you know video game addictions, mm -hmm. and it, it walks us through you know not not only the kids but with but the parents and how families can manage screen time and paying attention to each other during all sorts of you know social time, and it's really it, it's really eye opening what. What, what's been found and what the what the information is there out there? <clears throat> Kids are are playing video games and not exercising. And you know one of the things that one of the biggest takeaways I got from it last night is that that children of any age, whether it's high school or or TK, that have after school activities, are less likely to have you know whoopy things go on with them with too much screen time. So it's just, it, it plays really into what we're looking at as a district and you know, how I feel as a parent about what my kids are doing. Okay. So, and I, so next show is May, May 11th? May 11th. It's at okay. the Boulevard Cinemas. If, okay. Yeah, I don't know Maureen well, the camera. Highland, but if we can, I don't know Maureen Highland, but Maureen Highland, if you're watching, if you can get it into the Argus on the school's page, it's just really an amazing. Is there a charge for that? Emily, she, she writes that article. No, 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 is there a charge? No, a that? charge for the screen. She writes it for free. $10 fundraiser. It's $10 They just literally got the email while I was sitting yeah. here. Okay. That, that's our name. Yeah, right, that's, well, the, that's the customary and traditional that, that the film company is asking is $10 a ticket. Okay. So, well worth the money. Bring your kids. If you go, parents, if you go, bring your kids. There's a lot of discussion afterwards, and it's, it's just, it's, it's better if your kids see it with you. We'll go again. So. Well, thank you, Mary. Okay, item 11, approval of consent agenda by consolidated motion. Second. Everybody good? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Item 12, our action items. Um, 12.1 Administration and Human Resources, 12.11 Resolution 1516-32 of the Board of Education of Petaluma City Elementary and Joint Union High School Districts, honoring the contributions of teachers to quality education, declaring the week of May 2 through 6, 2016 as the, quote, week of the teacher, close quote. Second. 
Carrie, you want to? Yeah, we would, you know, we find it very important that we want to declare the week of the teacher being May 2nd to the 6th, and just to honor everything that our teachers are doing for our students. Okay, because that's really, really deserved and warranted, and I don't have any idea, do you that? Kids are already ahead of us, we're all doing all great. kinds of stuff, yeah, it's all kinds time. of emails going out about how to honor Good. the teacher. The, teacher, the kids are excited? Yeah. Good. Well, the teachers we're deserve it. That cost that we have to do it the next week because of schedule conflicts, but okay. we're... But we're going to do we're it. We're going to do it. All right. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five on. Okay. 12.1.2, Declaration of Need for Fully Qualified Educators in the Petaluma City Elementary School District for 2016 to 2017. Second. Yeah, Anybody have a chance to uh, review that? Yep. Anybody have questions or comments? Is that do we do that annually? Yes. We yeah. Do that annually. Mm -hmm. Gives you flexibility in case you need to you need to utilize it. Okay. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Twelve point one point three declaration need for fully qualified educators of Pillow Joint Union High School District for 26, 2017. Uh, Second. Take okay, there's nothing different there, Gary? No, it's okay. the same thing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. 12.2 business services, 12.2.1 purchase orders. Moved. Second. You're out of this. Pretty have a chance to look at that? Mm-hmm. You're out of this one. You okay with everything, Pete? On the purchase orders, yes. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Expenditures, 12.2.2. Everybody have a chance to look at that? Moved. Okay. Second. I can't vote. Like, um, okay. So, all in uh, favor? Aye. 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 4.0 was one, one abstention yeah. or recusal. 12.2.3 uh, joint use agreement authorization for the board to authorize the agreement with the Petaluma Tennis Association regarding the use of the tennis courts at Casa Grande High School and Petaluma High School. Moved. Second. Have we have a chance to look at that? Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So what, is that something new? Did we do that anymore? It's the first one I've seen. That's cool. This is a newbie. I'm the tennis coach. I'm the president <laughs> of the Pedaling Tennis Association. Um, <laughs> what, what created the need for an agreement? Yeah. I'm just curious. The Pedaling Tennis Association is a sanction. Oh, wait, introduce yourself, please. Yes, I will. Yeah. Thanks. My name is Chris Horn, currently the Petaluma High School boys tennis coach. I'm also a professional tennis player and coach for about 30 years. And the Petaluma Tennis Association, which is a body that existed many years ago for public tennis and the promotion of public tennis, operated primarily out of New Casey Park and McNair Tennis Courts. Very active at one time, back in the 90s, had close to 500 plus members. It's a sanction Community Tennis Association by the United States Tennis Association. Well, throughout the years, that Petaluma Tennis Association dwindled. And now, after being in the community for a couple years teaching, I notice there's an extreme need to promote public tennis in our community. And I've worked effortlessly with the United States Tennis Association to rekindle and revitalize the Petaluma Tennis Association. But in order to really have a community tennis association, you have to have tennis courts in order to provide programs and promote tennis. And so being as now that I'm actively involved on a high school level with the tennis courts and what happens here, then what I wanted to do was to approach the school district to see if we could, in a joint use agreement, utilize a tennis court to have a home for the Petaluma Tennis Association both at Casa Grande and at Petaluma High School. We're not reinventing the wheel. There's many communities throughout the Bay Area that do the same thing. Community tennis associations go into partnerships with public entities, whether parks and recs or school district, so that they can have a home to provide their tennis programs and to promote public tennis, from juniors all the way up to seniors and everything in between. And so what you have before you tonight is a joint use agreement between the school district and the Petaluma Tennis Association, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, to provide tennis for our public players in the community. 
Okay. I, I just have to ask, yeah, I just have to ask the question because as you all know, this is sort of my little issue. Absolutely. I'm completely for that. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with it. I'm curious as to, um, is McNear not suitable? Is it not enough? Is it because I asked that question sure. under the guise of the school district provides significant facilities for recreation in the city of Petaluma and mm -hmm. the city of Petaluma doesn't. Right. And so I'm just curious as to why the schools instead of the state of the courts so it is or the parks and rec are just unplayable. And what's nice about the high school courts, they're in exceptional condition. They're just nearly redone. And absolutely. And part of the partnership with the Petaluma Tennis Association the School District is for us to generate funding that we put right back into the tennis courts. So it takes a lot of financial burden off the school district in order to maintain and upkeep the courts. I have absolutely no issue with that. Again, my issue simply goes back to the school district has become the primary source of providing recreational facilities for the city of Petaluma instead of the city of Petaluma. Sure. That's, no, my, that's I my totally point. understand. But I welcome you in my neighborhood. Thank Hopefully you, Mr. Sanderson. I appreciate it. Plus, you keep the skateboarders out there. Nice. I absolutely. appreciate that, too. I've had, I've had uh, two town hall meetings with close to 100 participants that have attended the meetings and easily over 90% are in total favor of, of what's happening with the Pelham Tennis Association. Okay. So they would really embrace you know, your participation, your partnership with our organization. Um, I have um, a few issues, uh, maybe it's just the inner lawyer in me, but um, first thing is it, the five years, Okay, so the initial term is five years. Mm -hmm. I have trouble with that in conjunction with the termination agreement where it says, uh, you know, these numbered, but it's on page two, it says PTA, which is your group, has the right to terminate this agreement without cause by written notification 60 days prior to the effective date of termination. Um, the district has 10 days, uh, a right upon 10 days to temporarily suspend court usage for repairs and then the district can only terminate this agreement for cause. So usually when I see that, it's that somebody's making a major financial commitment and doesn't just want to be bounced in 30 days because they've you know, substantially improved and they use a long term like five years because they want to recoup or at least get to enjoy the benefit of their financial investment. Now there's no financial investment commitment in this, no. correct? No. Okay. So it just seems to me, Gary, like either make it term this agreement shall be for a year, or we should have the right to terminate written uh, without cause by written notification 60 days. It should be a good standard same, clause. Same. Yeah, 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 I'd absolutely. be much more comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, and That's that just true. takes the cause element right out of it. It's just like if all of a sudden, I mean, you're our high school coach, but if high school tennis explodes and we, we need to use that thing all the time. Absolutely. Or somebody did come in and say, look, that's great that PTA did that, but we're over here at the United States Tennis Association. We'll pay you, you know, $2,000 a month. And I'm not saying you should, or we're mercenary like that, because we do like to have our facilities used by the public. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, at some point in time, though, Gary, it has to be where we aren't obligated. This one's like a five-year exclusive. Right. We've got to be careful with that. And again, this particular joint use agreement is a boilerplate that's used by many different communities and their association with school districts. So the flexibility for whatever changes that you would like to make in that agreement is... Right. Oh, I'm with Troy. In, in concept, it, it sounds great. Don't get me wrong. But so. the devil's in the details and the way I think about these things are none of us are around and you're not around and now we have a whole different cast of characters who are pounding on this thing to stick with the letter Absolutely. of the agreement. So do you want this to come back or do you need a motion to add that, to change that language? Or do we, we just need a motion to enter into an agreement and then we'll work on it and we'll take it through. Okay, so we'll we can go ahead and move on the motion we have. So was it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. We'll, take it through, we'll take it through yes. legal and make sure. Okay, so this is an agreement to bind us. This is an agreement that we're just a, a proposal. Yeah. But we're not agreeing to it. Okay, I can support on that. We don't agree to this. For me, for me, there, 
there are steps that I need to take that I don't want to take until I know that there's a partnership in place. For instance, the, the old Petaluma Tennis Association had a 501c3, but they let it go inactive. In order to reactivate it for the government, it cost $800. And I don't want to pay that $800, obviously, until I know that there's an agreement between the two organizations. You have to vote down this motion and then... Can't I withdraw it? You can withdraw it. I withdraw it. Look at that. Through that curveball. Withdrawn. I will make a motion to, what should I say, authorize the superintendent to enter into an agreement with the corrected language due to the for cause element discussed. Is that? There you go. Mm -hmm. is Love that, it. We'll, we'll go through it. We'll take a look at it and I'll let you get one more look at it. Okay. The changes. Okay. Um, and then the, the actual details of the agreement, but the right. we were supporting the partnership. Because for me, also the five years was that some sort of critical. Well, that's just that's kind of a standard between what we use between CTAs okay. and and yeah, their just, public just facilities. Want to make sure you just didn't spin the old board. No, <laughs> not at all. That's that's just kind of kind of a standard in the industry of how the agreements go okay. in five years. So. Let me just walk away from the podium knowing that I can move forward now and secure our insurance because... Not until you have a second and we vote. Okay. Could I have a second? Are you comfortable with the motion? You good? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> Aye, we've got a lot of the tennis in our community. Thank you. Well, four Thanks for waiting so long. Love oh, no problem. This, was, this is a passion for you. Will you do me one favor? Uh -oh. For Troy, skateboard tennis. <laughs> skateboard tennis. <laughs> now that would be an athlete, right? If I can find some wheels that don't destroy the court, I'm all for it. I like the, like hearing this thing. Yeah, I oh, know. Oh. Right, Keep your good. dogs off the tennis court. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, Joe, that was for you. Right. Uh, like, uh, Twelve point two four or twelve point two point four. Change order authorization for the board to authorize change order number. Hot uh, uh, one from Murray Building Inc. in the amount of ninety-five thousand seventy-seven dollars via secondary bond funds as part of Pelham High School gym floor and bleacher replacement project. Can I just ask a question? No, you have second for second. Now you don't ask a question. It's now far away, Mary. I I looked at this. It, it was it's twenty-five percent of the original bid. And there was one item on there, it was $35,000 to put in a handicap uh, parking space. Well, one, I found one, a partner. One, <laughs> it was one handicap parking space for $30,000 and $5,000 to change the front of it so that it didn't pawn. Uh, it just seems like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Yes? Yep. It's the price of a new car. Yes, it is. Okay. Your question is, yeah, it's it's appalling. The costs are appalling. Okay. We're in California. Okay, and they place standards on us that are far and above what your average contractor would see in the field. Once it goes through the uh, division of state architect, uh, they put criteria on us, and the this particular ADA section was missed by our architects at the beginning, and so it was an add-on, and that's always more expensive. And the, uh, most contractors like change orders, because then, they, uh, then it gets very, very pricey at that point. So you're saying that it's correct? It is absolutely correct. It's appallingly correct. Is it any responsibility of the architect? Did they take on any of those associated costs? It wasn't a mistake, it was an omission. We would have paid for it anyway. But not maybe? potentially $35,000. Maybe it would have been 20000 if we had done it up front. No. It was the same. I wish Ray was here. Uh, I don't have the breakdown on his numbers. But did they have no liability or responsibility for paying any of that portion? No, it, of just, the, it, just, it was just omitted so they did nobody bid, bid on it. So one of the biggest risks that we have 
in our projects are okay. things just like that because contractors yeah. make their money on change orders. That is correct. And if we have plans that and the plans go very specific and if something gets omitted, nobody bid on it, and then we have to accept a change order and try to negotiate it, which I'm sure you did. Absolutely. Uh, and I think Phoebe's question is that if it hadn't been omitted and it had been included, right. it would, have been would it have still been $95,000 or would it have been less? It, it would have been less. understood you. You said it would be less. Yes. By about how much? I have no idea. Okay. So it's something we had to redo something. It wasn't just... It wasn't redo. It was omitted. Classic. Basically. Well, no, but emissions can be, yes. you know, I can build this building. It's a lot cheaper if I forgot to put on, you know, the face plates, those lights, then I forgot the interior studs. So I'm saying it was a... You know, there's emissions that are external, internal, correct, and some cost more than others. But this sounds like a like a handicapped parking spot. It uh, was. But you have to remember that we've also look at me coming to Joe's defense here because this is I. <laughs> no, no, this no, is my, no, no, no. Well, hey, it's no, not no, Joe's defense. Let me finish. But it's just Joe's. The but I mean, we spend fifty thousand dollars to make sure that a portable can properly sit on the ground next to another portable. It's when we do a geological test on it. I mean, the stuff that we spend money on. Based upon exactly what Joe said, the DSA and the requirements of the state of California. All you have to do is look at the baseball dugouts at, at Pelham High School. You could land a helicopter on top of those things. Mm -hmm. They are so sturdy. So, yeah. I guess it's regrettably the cost probably, of doing business in this state. Probably what bothers me more, it, the most is if the state's given us funds and they want to impose all those conditions on their funds that they give us for whatever, capital improvements, whatever, then great. I guess that's the game the state wants to play. But this is. This is our fellow citizens' funds. These are the taxpayers' funds. This is private funds going to public projects. Correct. So I think we're all just hypersensitive on yeah. any expenditures, overruns, change orders. You know, we can't do much about how the state wants to spend its money, but it's looking like we can't do as much as I thought we could do with how we spend the uh, hardworking taxpayers' money. Correct. So, I mean, I, I know you're looking at me. I, this isn't on you, and you explain the reasons, but it's my job. Right. There's, I have no problem. There's no, uh, there's no way around it. And so, Mary, I mean, you're coming to the same realization. All of us came from private industry. We first came on this board. Like, what? That cost how much? Yeah. It was jaw dropping. Right. Well. And do we express our displeasure with people that omit really important things that cost oh, yes. us money later? We do. Well, and that's sort of to follow up with Terry. I mean, we do so much business with Clark and Associates that yes. how do you overlook a handicapped parking space at a public place? I mean, I just, I mean, I, I assume, I mean, we do so much business with them and we have so much business going forward with them. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, we assume they're the experts, so we rely on them. We, we incurred no more engineering costs on that change order. Uh, QKA eight the additional engineering costs. That was part of the discussion I had with them. And part of the discussion. For omit, omitting the ADA. The costs there reflect the subcontractor, the concrete, the labor. And part of our, if you remember the discussion we had about this previously as well, is our lack of mm -hmm. dearth of available alternatives from a vendor standpoint with regard to architects, with regard to uh, DSA inspectors. Yes. But, it's not that there's some just dozens of us sitting there bidding on our stuff, unfortunately. We get. I'm not, I, and trust me, I'm not defending yeah. it at all. I'm just explaining it because right. Joe and I have had long conversations about this. I so I, I would hope that Murray and whoever that is gets off of your Christmas card list. That would be a private discussion. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have that with you. Yes, we'll, we'll have that as well. Okay. Well, um, so you, this is your recommendation? Yes. Okay. Um, any more questions? That closes that, that okay. project out. I'm sorry. I believe that closes that project That out. project is closed. Okay. By the way, it turned out very nice. It's beautiful. It really did. Yeah. Well, and the other way we can take away from it, Joe, is you did save a considerable amount of other taxpayers' money when we didn't do the portico out there. Remember that whole? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this project has, it's given and it's taken away a little bit. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, kind of really did a good job. Yeah, so thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So now we'll go to, so it's nice when we skip down the bottom end of the money spectrum, 
2.5 change order authorization for the board authorized change order number out of four from A. E. Nelson Construction of $18,794 via secondary bond funds as part of the Casa Grande High School Athletic Facility Project. Moved. Second. Okay. Joe? That was it. This was a carryover. I had asked this to be pulled from the last um, board meeting, um, which we resolved our issue related to um, with A. Nelson. So we're just bringing okay. this back forward. Yeah, it's a compiling <coughs> for about five or six small change orders that I authorized, but we held on to uh, until they finished a couple of things we wanted them to finish. And so it was held over from the last meeting. And you're satisfied? I am satisfied at this point. And okay. this, is, this is now it for that project too? This is it for this project. Close it on okay. yeah, it's less than 1% on a $2.6 million project. Yeah. So, I, yeah, good job. Did and does Mary get to finish. carry the ceremonial torch on the first official it's a, lap run? It's a beautiful complex. It really is. <laughs> So it's a stunning it's complex. It's so pretty there. Yeah. It's just is the lining of the track. Did that all get? That's one of the things. That's why we held on to this eighteen thousand dollars. It's just that was one of the snafus. It's Gary saved that for me for when I came back. It's so we're we're going to have the grand opening, Gary, so for the end of the school year. Have you seen that? Well, that we're going to see a graduation. graduation. <laughs> <laughs> so has the lines on the track been corrected? Did you? That is correct. Oh. Speaking of graduation, what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing there. Trust me, 10 years ago it's different. <laughs> All right, so again, you comfortable with everything? I'm happy with that. All right, just your All recommendation. Right. Okay, no more questions or comments. All in favor? No. Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot. And for Santa for taking all that withering cross. No, 12.2.6 expenditure authorization, Proposition 30, Education Protection Account, EPA. Moved. Discussion? Anyone, anyone? Gary, pipe in anytime. This is just a constitutional amendment that we're spending money the way that we are supposed to be spending it. Would we spend it any other way? I mean, we're constitutionalists. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. 13, discussion information only. 13.1, administration slash human resources. 13.11, amendment. Rather than read each one of these, maybe. Yeah, Does anybody have any no questions or comments on the 13.11 to 13.2? No. no. Everybody okay with it? Yeah. No questions? Okay. 14. Anybody have any future business? We just had a meeting. We have a, we have a meeting on Thursday, right? We need still a lot to yes. do tonight. And what time is the meeting starting? 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, and that's for facilities discussion? 5 o'clock. Okay. Yes. So it's now 5 o'clock and there's no meeting before that or activity before that? It's just straight 5 o'clock right meeting? Right Yeah. Right And there's nothing else on that agenda? Mm -hmm. No, there is. There is facility in there and there's potential action on the session. There was a, a day of rose potential. No. Yeah. yeah. Potential no, action. Yeah. That, no, that wouldn't okay. Yeah. All right, so 15 uh, signing of papers, which I'll take care of you with, with you, Sue. And if you need Sherry or Gary to sign. And then uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session.